So now I will present you the tools which allow you to take advantage of the data that we integrate and structure in BG to um, find biology, basically. So uh, the first thing we have is that we have expression cause, as you've seen. And so one thing is that uh, similar, so one thing is our gene page. And our, our gene page, you, um, Frédéric has shown you some highlights of it before. You're going to see for a given gene, all the expression conditions defined by anatomy, development, sex, or strain. You can restrict the data to see only the information from RNA-seq or single-cell RNA-seq and situ hybridization and so on. And you have the separate list of which in which anatomical structures uh, gene is significantly present or significantly absent, both from the direct observation and the propagation that Frederick showed you. So you can call a gene present in the brain because there was an experiment done on the brain or because there was an experiment done on the cerebellum, because it was present in the cerebellum, it is present in the brain. We also have directly on each gene page, orthologs and paralogs, so homologous genes, and you can click and it takes you to a tool I'll show you a bit further of comparison of expression between genes. And of course, we have cross-references to Uniprot, Ensemble, gene cards, and so on. And so this is, uh, and we have uh, also similar to how you can browse the process data that, and the raw data that Felix just showed you, you can browse also our expression calls. So here I have looked for the gene, uh, sorry, the expression uh, calls of the gene Hox D8 in uh, uh, zebrafish, I think. And you have here where the information comes from. And for each of them, you can eventually click and find all the, where did we get this information from and what is the exact values and so on for all the calls per uh, gene. So I'll show you, a, I'll do a small wool clap. Okay. okay. Um, so if you, I'm going to ask you how you want to use the gene page. So I'm starting the Wook Lab. So you've seen all the types of information we can have and you can uh, configure the gene page to see your favorite information and priority. So here you can choose in this Wook Lab whether you want to see only anatomical entities, only development stage, only sex, only strain, or some combination. So I didn't put all the combinations possible. So if I didn't put your favorite one, you could just click other. So the votes are very spread, seems. So most of you want to see either only anatomy, which is what we show by default if you go to our gene page. So if I click here on a gene, you see here by default, it's loading here, you see anatomical entity only. So you see which are the anatomical entities where this gene is expressed in priority, but also many of you would like to see anatomy and developmental stage, so age or embryonic stage, and then some also other features. So that's why we have all these options that if you want to see primarily only strain or sex or some combination, you can see it. I'll go back to my... PowerPoint. Okay. And so another, the next tool I'm going to present, I think is very uh, original to BG. It's, we call it Topanat. And so the idea you probably, most of you know, gene ontology enrichment. So you have a list of genes that you got from some analyzers or some experiment. You wonder what do these genes do? And you plug them into some either website or R package, and it tells you these genes have more uh, kinases and transcription factors than expected by chance in the background genome. And you learn something about the function. And you can also learn something about the function of your genes if you look where are they expressed. And so we have implemented exactly the same type of test. So the mathematics is the same, but instead of comparing whether we have overrepresentation of genes annotated to specific gene ontology terms, we think if we have, we look if we have overrepresentation of genes 
annotated to specific anatomical terms. And so we can compare these lists. So here we have, uh, for example, from an example, I have a list of genes and 46 of the genes of this list are found in the frontal pole, which is a part of the brain. Is this more than I expect by chance? Well, for this, I'm going to do a contingency table. So I have 46 genes from my list, which are expressed in this frontal pole, this Uberon ID. But they also have 3,464 genes from my list, which are not expressed in the frontal pole. So some are, but most are not. But if I look at all, and if I look, sorry, these are other genes expressed in the frontal pole. And from my list, 56 are expressed in, not expressed in the frontal pole. Sorry for this. So I have 46 out of this total, 46 plus 56, which I expressed in the frontal pole from my list, whereas from the whole genome, 3,464 out of more than 36,000. And 35,000, sorry. And so this is six times more than I expect by chance. I would expect much less, sorry, I'd expect six here. So this is 7.6 times more than expected by chance. I would expect six genes from my gene list to be expressed in the frontal pole. I have 46, that's 7.68 times more than expected by chance. And this is highly significant by an exact Fisher test. So my gene list is overrepresented in the frontal pole. And you can actually reproduce this exact analysis here. It's an example from the top on that page. It's genes which were found by various genetic studies to be associated to uh, autism. And they, the frontal pole is a part of the brain which is known to be associated with autism. And these genes are much more expressed in this part of the brain than you would expect by chance. And in fact, we do this for every anatomical structure. So for every anatomical structure where you have expression, we're going to take our gene list, look how many expressed in this anatomical structure, how many are not expressed, do this for the background, other genes, do a Fisher test. We could also do a hypergeometric test. And we use a deconvolution of the, we have the positivity, we use the code from TopGo, which is a package to do analysis of gene ontology enrichment, which allows to take into account the graph. Because obviously, if I have genes which are more expressed than by chance in the frontal pole, they're also more expressed than by chance in the brain in general. So I don't. I want to not repeat ten times the same information because they have all these levels of information. They express in the frontal pole, in the brain, in the head. This is redundant information. So we can deconvolute. It's called the ontology graph by different ways, and we have basically modified the code from the top go package, which does this for gene ontology. So we can do it for uh, anatomical uh, enrichment. Now, I want to attract your attention. If you do these enrichment analyses, whether you do them for gene ontology or whether you stop at that. They are very powerful, potentially. They are very interesting, but they have pitfalls that you should be aware of. And the number one pitfall is background. So if I compare, if I have genes which were found by whole genome scanning, my background should be the whole genome. So that's pretty easy. But if, for example, I have differentially expressed genes from an experiment, and I want to know what is the gene ontology enrichment and what is the top and enrichment, my background is only the genes for which I could do the differential gene expression, which means the types of genes I could access through my protocol. Maybe I only took poly A, maybe I only took uh, coding genes and so on. And the ones for which I had sufficient data. So genes which, for example, I filtered in the first step as being not expressed with some arbitrary TPM cutoff or with BG tools. I didn't do differential gene expression, so they cannot be studied. So I want to remove, to have as a background as my expectation here, other genes, only the genes which I could study, which could be in my gene list. This is very important because if you do this wrongly, your results, you're going to think an organ is overrepresented in your gene list, where actually it's overrepresented in your experiment in general. So for example, if you look at uh, GWAS results, they tend to more easily find long genes. So your sample will be overrepresented for long genes. If you look at genes which were duplicated in one species relative to another. You can only study the genes for which you find homologs between the two species and so on. So you want to take the right background. Another pitfall is simply multiple testing. So we implement a FDR correction. There are different tools to correct, but you just think that because you're doing this over every term of your ontology and we have tens of thousands of terms, 
you're going to have a lot of gene uh, multiple testing, sorry. And the terms are not independent. As I told you, uh, frontal lobe is not independent of brain. So we use the algorithms from top go to uh, correct for this. And Topanat is available both on our website and in our R package, BGDB. So on the website, there are not all the possible options, but it's very easy to do. It's like most of you are used to tools to do gene ontology enrichment. You paste your gene list, you choose a background or you take the whole genome by default, and you just click analyze, and it's going to give you the result. And if you want to be much more, to use much more parameters or simply to include it within your our pipeline, we have an R package where you can not only do the same things, but you can also, for example, specify, I only want to see expression in uh, a certain stage of development, only in old individuals, only in mid-development and so on. So you can be much more specific. And here I will ask you in the Google doc to give me the, write to me a description of a gene list that you have tested or would like to test in top of that. So which is the gene list which comes from your work or your interests where you would like to see, okay, where are these genes expressed? You know, it could come from a medical question, evolutionary question, uh, gene family, anything which is of interest to you. Okay, so now something we are also quite unique about is homology. So in now we didn't really develop this because we don't have time to show you everything, but in our curation work, we also do manual curation of homology relations at the anatomical level. So most of you are probably used to finding autologous genes by various methods, but also you have homology at the anatomy level. So the human brain is homologous to the human, uh, to the mouse brain. That's kind of trivial, but when you get to more specific substructures, it's less trivial. And when you get to more distant species, say comparing a human not to a mouse, but to a zebrafish or to a fly, it becomes less and less trivial. And so for this, the, uh, the homology at the anatomical level is curated by reading specialized literature. So evolutionary development of biology, comparative zoology, paleontology, all this literature. And we have annotated the specific homology at the anatomical level, and we have a tool which allows you to access it. So this tool, uh, simply uh, the anatomical homology um, browser, and you put anatomical terms from your or cell ontology, and you choose species and it gives you the homology. And so for here, for example, I put all the tissues which I found in the human GTEC large data set, you've heard about several times, and ask for homologs between human and zebrafish. So I find which of these tissues, which of these samples that have been studied in this very large human data set could I also study in zebrafish? And so you see that there are several here which don't have homologs. And I find also several which have clear homologs. So hypothalamus of human and zebrafish is the same word for the same thing for homology. I also have cases where it's different terms. So the heart left ventricle or the primary heart field here or here, the lung and the swim bladder. So the mammalian or tetrapod lung is homologous to the swim bladder of teleost fishes. And so if you wanted to compare this gene expression between homologous organs, this is the samples you should compare. And now that's purely at the anatomical level, but now we can leverage this homology at the anatomical level to compare gene expression between species. So as you know, many Bindfine resources give you autologs and paralogs, so genes that you can compare between and inside species. But if you want to compare not just the gene sequences, but the expression between species, you need to say, what am I comparing? What does it mean to compare gene expression between a human and a zebrafish? I need to have the structures in which I can compare. I cannot just say this is the level of expression in general in a human or in a zebrafish. I want to say the level of expression in the lung and in the swim bladder, in the uh, what do they have here in the hypothalamus of each species and so on. So we combine these two information. So that if you go to this page called expression comparison, you can put a gene list from several species here, unlike Topanet where you could put only one species. And it's going to give you the structures which are homologous between the species represented by these genes and which have expression in these for these genes. And by default, it ranks it on the expression score but you can change the ranking by clicking on these columns here. And so for here, I have clicked on the example of 
SRRM4, which is a vertebrate brain-specific gene from the literature. And it gives me the autologs of this gene in various vertebrates. And here I have that there are three species with data in cerebral cortex. Not all species have such detailed data, and that's the highest expression. There are nine species among these which have data in the cerebellum, and that's the second highest, and so on. And I see that I have very, I have brain parts which come up, which have the expression of all the genes which have expression are expressed there. I don't have any which are absent, and they have very high scores which are shared between these species. So I can compare any gene expression between species very easily like this. And on our gene page, there's a link on every gene page to the orthologs and the paradox, which are predefined by some other bioinformatic resource, which brings you directly here, where you can compare directly. So you have your gene of interest in zebra fish. You think, okay, how conserved is this expression in other fishes? You click on orthologs, you click on the, uh, the level of taxonomy of fishes, and you click comparison, it will bring you here and give you the answer. And we are the only ones who can give you this answer because we're the only ones who annotate to the homology of anatomy and who integrate all this information. So here, maybe in one species, it's RNA-seq, and another species, microarray, and another species, single-cell RNA-seq. It's all brought together to give you this answer, which is the biology that we need of how conserved is the gene expression between these species. And so that's the end of this course. So uh, I hope that we've shown you how BG could help you understand gene expression, which as you've seen, I think over the morning is a rather complex uh, concept and with many different uh, parameters which intervene to help you do biology, which is really our goal. Um, and so, as I said, I would have to leave a bit early, but we can start to have some, we can already answer your questions now and then Frédéric will stay a bit yeah. later than me, I think. Before that, thanks, uh, considering the interest for the expression comparison and the question of the UNG, maybe I, I would like just to show briefly that you can do the comparison, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, if you go to the gene search, uh, you enter UNG and you can click on the first link here. And then you have a link here, autologs or autologs here. And you get the autologs at different taxonomic levels. So, and you can automatically compare expressions. So here at Cordata level, this is a bit slow, I already did it. So those are all the gene identifier of UNG genes. Uh, and what you can see is that apparently there is a huge conservation, a high conservation in ovary and testis, uh, reproductive system more generally, um, or endocrine system. So I don't know if it makes sense, digestive system, uh, yeah, so and the renal system. So apparently, it's a lot of reproductive, digestive, endocrine, renal. I don't know if it makes sense to you uh, related to your question about UNG genes. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to show that then it's not an enrichment as in Topanet, but you can look for the expression conservation between species. 